submarine sank thousands of Allied ships. U-boats were so successful, many thought they could win the war, until the Allies launched an all-out effort to destroy them. Two out of three U-boats would perish. Four out of five U-boat sailors were killed. Yet, there was no shortage of volunteers to go to war in the Iron Coffin. Meet the sailors who man the U-boats, next on Dangerous Mission. Unterseeboot, shortened simply to U-boat, was the German word for submarine. They had once ruled the seas, but by the middle of the Second World War, the men who sailed the U-boats knew they were closer to the ocean bottom than they were to their home port. The ferocious Allied offensive against the U-boats had made them obsolete fighting machines. For most U-boat sailors, a thousand miles from shore inside a steel tube. It was just a matter of time before their U-boats were found and destroyed. At the beginning of the war, you didn't have the feeling that it really would get you. You said, ah, they won't get me, they won't get us. Later on the war, you knew that you were taking a terrible risk the minute you left port. The number of my classmates was, at the beginning of the war, around about 450. And around about 230 lost their life in the war. And you can imagine what it means. I was operating in the Atlantic when I heard that the center of the submarines was asking for my best friend Anders. He didn't answer. Then I knew that, uh, well, that he uh, was lost, and that was a great loss to me personally, and so I felt absolutely alone now. By 1943, the U-boat had become the target of thousands of Allied aircraft and warships, all set on the U-boat's destruction. When you hit your dead, the boat is broken to pieces. But if a dead shot is very close, then every, many things about the boat happen. The lights go out, and the pipes break, and there's water coming in here, and, and everyone is doing something to repair damage. And uh, this is a little bit frightful situation. And when a boat goes down to a depth that normally is not your diving depth, the next second something happens and you are dead. The fierceness of the Allied campaign against the U-boat was the result of the submarine's initial success. 1939 to 1942 were the glory years for the U-boats and the elite force of volunteers who sailed them. Brass bands played when they departed for patrol. Pretty young women welcomed them home. Stories of their successes were broadcast to a proud German public. Täglich steuern neue Heimkehrer ihre Stützpunkte an. And in this case, the propaganda was true. The U-boats were the most feared fighting ships in the war. Merchant sailors lived in constant fear they were going to be torpedoed. And if you're in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, even in summertime, water temperature is 50 degrees, a few hours in that, you're dead. They slept with their clothes on, Lifeboats were always rigged and ready to go with food, flares, and water. It was a very difficult period. The U-boats left their heavily defended home ports in the Mediterranean and North Seas, as well as the coast of France, and prowled the ocean for their prey. Merchant ships carrying war supplies to Germany's enemy, the English. The merchant ships came from the United States, Canada, and South America. In an attempt to protect themselves, the merchant ships gathered and crossed the Atlantic in large groups known as convoys, 
which were escorted and guarded by destroyers. But U-boats employed a tactic called the Wolf Pack that was devastatingly effective. The U-boats spread out in great lines across the ocean. When one U-boat spotted a convoy, it held its fire and radioed the others. Once the others had gathered, they attacked as a pack. By first patrol as captain of the boat, we were positioned in a line of 40 subs. I was on the northern part of the line and the convoy was detected by the southern boat. I dived and get the bearing of the convoy by sonar. I could think to ships in this convoy. I could see the parts of the boat thrown up in the air. Initially, the wolf packs were unstoppable. When the men inside the U-boats, sinking British ships began to take on a routine. Each U-boat was identified, not by a name like U.S. subs, but by a number. Folkmar Koenig was a midshipman on U-99. With warships, with battleships or submarines where you send torpedoes to another target, it's completely impersonal. You think of the ship and you think of the merchant ship you want to sink and you don't think of the poor people that perhaps have to jump into the water from a burning tanker into the burning oil. Yeah? You don't think of that. It's just something you are trained for and, and you do more or less f as a routine work. To a sailor on a battleship, it was a, a mean way of doing warfare. Ah, they sneak around here somewhere underneath and what, they should come and stand it and we shoot it out. Some convoy battles were over in hours. Some would take days. Generally, they would try to attack at night. Some of the U-boats would scatter around the convoy and fire from outside. Some of the guys would deliberately get inside the convoy to where it was almost impossible to attack him. The method of attack depended on the particular skipper. The existence of such deadly submarines in the early years of World War II, 1939 and 1940, had caught the British off guard. Two decades earlier, at the end of World War I, Germany had been forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Among its many restrictions was the outlawing of German U-boats because of their effectiveness during the First World War. But the German Navy began to violate the agreement just three years after it was signed. They secretly purchased a Dutch submarine building firm and began constructing U-boats for other countries. The goal was to ensure that the German Navy stayed on the cutting edge of submarine design. By 1932, Germany was openly building new boats in direct violation of the treaty. In September of 1935, Adolf Hitler tapped former World War I U-boat captain Karl Dönitz to command his U-boat fleet. Dönitz had reasoned Germany could win a war against Britain if the enemy's food and supplies could be cut off. It was Dernitz who first declared the proper target for a U-boat was not the warship, but the merchant ship. Dernitz knew that if his U-boats could sink more ships than the British could build, Germany would win the war. Once the war began in 1939, Dernitz's plan was more successful than anyone could have imagined. By 1940, the U-boats and the men who sailed them had become the sharks of the sea. But as the sharks pressed their attack, the Allies were hard at work planning their destruction. The German Navy, called the Kriegsmarine, commissioned nine different types of U-boats. More than half were what they called the Type 7. This type sank more tonnage per boat than any other submarine. It required a crew of 51 sailors, four officers and 47 men. They coexisted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, shoulder to shoulder, in a steel tube roughly the size of two railroad cars. 
The men on a U-boat lived and worked in a tight, confined space packed with weapons and machines. Each sailor's job was crucial. They literally held one another's lives in their hands. It made for a camaraderie that existed in few other places. It did exist in an aircraft where you had six or eight or ten people. If someone screwed up on the airplane, you could lose the plane. But they were dependent upon each other only for those two, four, six hours. When the plane landed, they dispersed. In the submarine, that crew was dependent upon one another for two or three months. That built a kind of camaraderie that I don't believe existed in any other military service. The fate of all men aboard depend on the last young seaman. If a seaman on lookout didn't see a destroyer, that is the fate for the entire boat and crew. On petrol we didn't wear our uniform or ranks, we had just more or less the same clothing aboard. We know each other and we know who was the other one. Gunther Heinrich was the captain of U-960. We were over eight weeks in the North Atlantic. And in this time, some boys do not see fresh air. And if any man aboard passes you, you could smell him. You did not look at him, you smell him. Kurt Diggins was just 27 years old when he captained U-458. I should say we were some kind of a family. I was very proud of my crew and uh, it uh, was for me very important that this crew always were satisfied with the old man of 27 years who was their captain. The men working inside the claustrophobic confines of a U-boat had some unusual ways to relieve the stresses. Sailors crossing the equator for the first time were baptized into the new hemisphere. Old hands dressed as Neptune, king of the sea, and Thetis, his queen. Inductees were shaved and had the northern dirt washed from their skin. But the camaraderie on board never took away from the fact that the U-boat was a weapon of attack and destruction. Before the war, Admiral Carl Dernitz had determined he would need a fleet of 300 U-boats to cut the British supply lines across the Atlantic. But when Adolf Hitler launched his Blitzkrieg in September of 1939, the German Navy wasn't prepared. Dernitz had just 57 U-boats. Yet, in spite of their modest number, the U-boats were a lethal fighting machine. In their first year of action, U-boats sank 438 merchant ships, an aircraft carrier, and 11 other warships. Buoyed by their early success, the German Navy began building U-boats at a furious pace. As the U-boat Navy swelled in size, so did the number of young German volunteers. Submariners were an elite group because of the effectiveness of their U-boats, and it was the torpedo that gave the U-boat its teeth. In 1940, the German torpedo could be set to travel at a predetermined angle. But once fired, its course couldn't be changed. U-boat captains worked to get as close as possible to their targets before firing. There were four torpedo tubes in the bow of a Type 7 U-boat. Additional torpedoes were stored here and could be loaded with heavy pulleys and chains. Most of the crew slept in bunks tucked between these massive weapons. Aft were two huge diesel engines that could drive the U-boat at 19 knots on the surface. An electric motor could propel it at only two to three knots when submerged. There was also another torpedo tube in bunks for the remainder of the crew. The 50-ton battery that powered the electric motor was below deck. Fuel and buoyancy tanks were located throughout and alongside the boat. Amidships stood the conning tower and the tiny captain's quarters. There was a galley and two toilets, one of which was packed with food when the boat left on patrol. 
Helmut Smeckel, Captain U-802. When we left the harbour, the whole way along the submarine was full of boxes and we went always over cases with food. We were prepared to stay without any support for four months or longer. Jürgen Ersten Captain three U-boats and organized wolf pack attacks. And the crew's quarters, there are torpedoes and potatoes and whatever uh, stuff is hanging around in between these bunks. And there's no such thing as private life. And there's nothing you can keep secret. Everybody knows everybody. And all his bad manners or his habits or his particulars. The lack of private space meant officers and crewmen lived and worked side by side. The officers mess. Okay, they had a small table and they had their bunks there. It was not very comfortable. It was cramped and, and crowded and well, you were on a submarine and not in a hotel, four-star hotel. Sleeping arrangements for the crew were less than first class. They hot bunked which means there was one bunk for every two sailors. One guy would be on watch and the other guy would be sleeping. And when the watch would change, one guy would tumble out of bed and the other guy would tumble in. The bed would still be warm and wet and rather smelly. U-boat sailors didn't see the sunlight because their job was down inside the submarine. Even when they were running surface, the only ones to see the sunlight would be the skipper, the officer of the watch, and the lookouts. The torpedo mechanics never saw the sun because they were in the torpedo room. The engine mechanics were back in the diesel room. Their job was inside the sub. So they would go weeks, months at a time without ever seeing the sun. When U-boats submerged, they were slow and awkward to handle. Most U-boats only dove to escape enemy attack. Even when they wanted to stay underwater, U-boats were forced to surface two hours a day to run their diesel engines and charge the enormous batteries that propelled the submarine when it was submerged. Yet, in spite of their limitations, the wolf packs decimated the British convoys. The men who sailed the U-boats became masters at their special brand of warfare. It's like big game hunting. On the other hand, maybe just seconds and then you turn from hunter to hunted, you see. And you try to trick the escorts, and the escorts try to catch you. That's of course a uh, question of second stage thinking, meaning that you try to do the opposite of what your opponent thinks you will do. But of course this takes hours and days sometimes. And if the other bloke has experience as well, then it may come to second stage or third stage thinking. It's just a matter of nerves. There was one thing that could rattle the nerves of even the most hardened submariner, the depth charge. Once submerged, a submarine was basically blind and defenseless. U-boat sailors had to wait out an attack and hope the destroyer missed their position. But the depth charge didn't have to actually hit the submarine. They were set to explode at a predetermined depth. Their powerful blasts instantly increased the water pressure around them and crushed the U-boat if it was near. Gerd Tater was the captain of U-466. I have had water bomb attacks in the Mediterranean up to eight hours, and we were counting at that time 180 water bombs. 181 to be correct. <laughs> As the charges exploded around them, the U-boat sailors waited together to see if it was their day to die. When a U-boat submerged, sailors simply breathed the air locked inside the boat when the hatch was sealed. After 24 hours, the oxygen supply grew thin. Carbon dioxide filters and oxygen gas canisters could help, but after 48 hours, the sailors would have to resurface or die. Captains trapped in the boat with their crew tried to appear cool under fire. You try to keep your mind under control, which is not so easy. And of course, 
you have to keep up a certain confidence in my parents with the crew or members of the crew. There was a submarine commander in the control room who uh, tried to make this appearance as well and had a book and was reading, but he had the book wrong time wrong. Whether they were reading a book upside down or simply waiting in silence, U-boat sailors knew the stakes were high. Unlike a surface ship, when a U-boat took a hit, it usually meant instant death for all hands on board. If they were close to the surface, they would basically drown. Any submarine, when it's hauled, almost invariably stands on one end and begins to sink. So suddenly you're laying on the floor that used to be the bulkhead. It's dark. Your buddies, your tools, your spare parts are all falling down in a pile. Eventually the submarine reaches its crush depth and it's over. When they're running extremely deep, it's instant death. Neither way is anything to look forward to. Still, U-boat sailors accepted the dangers of their mission. Every month they sent hundreds of thousands of tons of British supplies to the bottom of the sea. By 1941, it looked as though nothing could stop them. Life on a German U-boat was hard, but it suited some men extremely well. Like the German Air Force, the U-boat service had its own aces. Although there was no set number of kills that put a man in this select company, the U-boat sailors knew who they were. Fearless skippers like Gunther Preen, Joachim Shepke, and most famous of all, Otto Kretschmer, who sank over 325,000 tons of British cargo, more ships than most countries had in their entire navies. Volkmar Koenig was just 20 years old when he was assigned to Kretschmer's famed U-99. It was his first patrol on a U-boat. But the first impression is it's a very familiar atmosphere. Because the light is low, and there are noises and humming of some machines, and the music is coming over the radio. And it's not a sterile atmosphere, it's, it's familiar, it's cozy somehow. I was lucky to come aboard a boat with a crew that had a lot of experience. They were old hands, and the captain was 28 years old, he was the old man. The men who held the title of U-Boat Ace had a cold-blooded confidence that defied the dangers around them. Kretschmer became an ace because he was cold-blooded and he was very intelligent. These two factors were the main reason for his success. I don't know what Kretschmer felt. He knew he was uh, in a war and he was uh, commanding a little boat in the, in the wide open spaces of the Atlantic, like a little Viking boat in former times and he knew what risks to take, and he knew he could rely on his crew. U-boat ace Eric Topp sank 38 ships, 185,000 tons, the third highest total in the war. I never have had fear on board of a submarine, even in very dangerous situations. And of course, that had an effect on my crew, and they were relying on me. <laughs> you know, when I met the wife of one of my men, she said to me, my, my husband says, when it is very dangerous, then I go into the pocket of my captain. <laughs> so, you see, they were relying on me, and uh, that is very important. But it was a sign of the dangers they all faced when three of Germany's aces were lost in March of 1941. Gunther Preen and his U-boat were sunk while approaching a convoy. Joachim Shepke was killed when a British destroyer rammed his U-boat. And Otto Kretschmer's U-99 was damaged by the British destroyer HMS Walker and forced to the surface. We came up to the surface and we were lucky that the destroyer was so near to us that when he opened fire the shells went over the boat because they couldn't turn down their guns so low that they would hit us. 
Treacherous crew managed to abandon their crippled boat and were plucked from the ocean by the crew of the destroyer. The lead engineer stayed aboard the sub and flooded the tanks to scuttle the U-99. But he couldn't escape before the boat sank. Gretschmer and the rest of his crew spent the remainder of the war in a Canadian prisoner of war camp. Initially, when the U.S. went to war with Germany in December 1941, it only made U-boats more effective. The American ships gave the U-boaters more targets to sink. By January 1942, U-boats were sinking American merchant ships along the United States' eastern seaboard and mining American harbors. By the beginning of 1943, Admiral Carl Dernitz had the largest submarine fleet ever assembled. The Germans were launching five new U-boats a week. March 1943 was the U-boat's peak of success. During that month alone, U-boats sank 120 Allied ships. But even as U-boat sailors enjoyed the victories of March, the British and American forces were working furiously to tip the balance against them. In the spring of 1943, ominous reports began circulating through the German fleet. It was becoming increasingly difficult for U-boats to avoid detection. Just eight weeks after the victories of March, came the month referred to by U-boaters simply as Black Bay. The tide of the U-boat battle turned in Black May of 43. There's no doubt about that. The German Navy lost 44 boats that one month alone. It was an absolutely devastating blow to Admiral Dönitz. The Kriegsmarine had no idea what had happened. They had suspicions, but they didn't know. In May of 1943, the Atlantic U-boats were overwhelmed. Wherever they went, Allied warships and airplanes seemed to be waiting, ready to attack. And the punishment they rained down was more ferocious than anything the submariners had seen before. After May 1943, to a large degree, taking a U-boat to sea was a suicide mission. The Germans never again achieved superiority at sea the way they had up until May of 43. Even as the Kriegsmarines searched for answers, their once powerful hunters were being slaughtered, and the Allies were increasing the pressure. For the men in the German U-boats, it would only get worse. The dramatic reversal of fortune faced by the U-boat fleet in Black May of 1943 was the result of several things. Admiral Karl Dernitz had insisted on daily communication with his U-boats. Message decoders, known as Enigma machines, were on board every boat. The German codes had baffled the Allies for years, but by May of 1943, British code breakers had finally cracked them. Now, the Allies knew everything Dernitz said to his captains and everything they said to him. It became one of the Allies' most closely guarded secrets. Matter of fact, our biggest problem became how do you disguise the fact that you were breaking their codes? You couldn't go after every U-boat, or pretty soon the Germans would realize you were breaking the code. Ironically, on at least two occasions, Dernitz started to believe that we had broken the U-boat codes. Both times he had groups of naval officers and scientists look at all of the available data and determine if we were breaking their codes. Both times they said no, their codes, their Enigma machine, was too complex, too good. But broken codes were only part of the U-Boaters' problem. By Black May, the Allies had also developed an airborne radar that airplanes could use to locate U-Boats traveling on the surface of the ocean. Now, unless a U-Boat was submerged, it would be found and attacked. On the surface, lookouts scanned the skies for enemy aircraft armed with submarine-killing machine guns and bombs. Once one was spotted, the U-boat made an immediate crash down. We were trained to disappear from the surface 
within 30 seconds and it took another 30 seconds to get down to 60 meter steps. If they couldn't get down fast enough, they would be halfway submerged with absolutely no, no defense and the aircraft would uh, finish them off easily. For U-boats spotted at nighttime, there was an additional Allied weapon that proved brutally effective. The Lee light was a 75,000 candle power light hung under the wing of a bomber. When they would find a U-boat on the radar, they would cut the engines, glide down on him, and at the very last moment, they would turn the engines on and turn on this Lee light, and suddenly the black of night turned into a floodlight right in their face. They, their night vision was gone. They had no time to react, and it was generally over in a few seconds for the sun. By May of 43, the Allies had perfected high-frequency direction finders, nicknamed Huff Duff, that could pinpoint a U-boat from the electronic signal emitted by its radio. Now, as soon as a U-boat radio operator tapped out a message, the Allies triangulated his signal and within seconds knew his exact location. Suddenly, the main tactical advantage of a submarine Stealth had been lost. By Black May, the Allies could not only find the U-boats, they also had new weapons that killed them. By May of 43, we had a significant number of B-24 Liberators. Liberator, in many respects, was the best anti-submarine aircraft of World War II. Liberator had tremendous range, carried a big sonar, and could carry a large payload of depth changes. There were also some new anti-submarine weapons becoming available, including homing torpedoes that you dropped out of an aircraft, and it listened for the noise of the submarine propellers, and then just tracked the submarine. A highly effective weapon. The Allies also built small aircraft carriers, known as Jeep or Pocket Carriers, to accompany the convoys. More ships were equipped with hedgehogs, mortar-like weapons that hurled two dozen bombs off the bow of a ship. Hedgehogs weren't set for a predetermined depth. They exploded on contact with the U-boat. Since they didn't explode unless they found their target, the hedgehogs made it possible to maintain sonar contact with the U-boat throughout the attack. The Allies also created special hunter-killer groups. Earlier in the war, destroyers had to stay with their convoys. But as more destroyers became available, hunter-killer groups were tasked to go on the offensive. Destroyers didn't let up until the U-boat was located and killed. Something they knew had happened when oil and air bubbles rose to the surface. And if it took two days, three days, whatever, they would stay right with it until they killed it. The attack would just go on and on and on endlessly. Uh, when the destroyers would be running low on depth charges, they would rotate other destroyers in and just keep raining depth charges on them. Suddenly. By May of 43, Dernitz was losing a U-boat a day. Among the thousands who died was Dernitz's own son, killed when U-954 was sunk. Dernitz pulled his U-boats from the Atlantic while they tried to regroup. By May of 43, the German U-boat was obsolete. The Allies, given time, would always find it. The Allies just overwhelmed them with technology and numbers. When you put the technology and the numbers together with the code breaking, the U-boats just did not have a chance. Unaware the Allies had broken his codes, Dernitz feared that spies were learning the U-boat's locations from men on the base. He began sending submarines to sea at night, under sealed orders. Not even the crew aboard knew where they were going. Till the end of the war, and many years after the war, no one really knew that the code, the German naval code, was very complicated, could be broken. It became increasingly difficult for the U-boat to survive, much less launch an attack. On 
June 4, 1944, just two days before the Allies were to storm the beaches of Normandy, the U.S. carrier Guadalcanal and five destroyers on patrol in the South Atlantic captured U-505 and its crew. This rare Navy film documents the capture of U-505. It was a sad comment on the fate of the U-boaters that while the capture was hailed as a victory to the public, inside the U.S. Navy it was met with anger and regret. Captain Dan Gallery was in command of the U.S. Navy task group. He had determined he wanted to capture a German submarine. I think a lot of it had to do with ego, but he also claimed that he would get the codes. But he didn't realize we already had the codes. The submarine was spotted on a Sunday morning just after church services on the carrier. The ship closed in on U-505 and bombarded it with depth charges. The sub shook them off, but was spotted again by aircraft. Ultimately, they damaged the submarine so badly it had to surface. Because Admiral Gallery decided to capture the submarine, he had already had the guns loaded with anti-personnel rather than armor-piercing ammunition, and they just fired to either kill the German crew or to chase them off the deck, which is basically what they did. And they sent whale boats to capture the submarine. And uh, Admiral Gallery was yelling Hyo Silver over the, <laughs> over, over the intercom, and they finally caught up with the uh, submarine then they picked up everybody out of the water and they put the submarine on the end of a tether and was bringing it back. Most people don't realize Admiral Gallery almost got into uh, a lot of problems over that. He wasn't supposed to capture the submarine, he was supposed to sink it. If the Germans had found out that the submarine had been captured and the codes had been compromised, they would have changed the codes and all the work would have uh, had to start over again. But Dernitz never learned who 505 had been captured. The German Navy assumed it was lost at sea with all hands, and they did not change their codes. Two days later, on June 6, 1944, the Allies invaded France. By this point in the war, only one U-boat in ten was returning from patrol. By 1944, Admiral Karl Dernitz and Adolf Hitler were fully aware that their U-boat fleet had become obsolete. But they also knew thousands of Allied warplanes patrolled the Atlantic looking for U-boats. If the U-boats stopped going on patrol, those planes would begin bombing German towns. So Dernitz continued to send the U-boat sailors into battle, where they faced a superior enemy, and often their own death. At sea, U-boats shared the same radio frequency. They could hear when sunken U-boats failed to answer calls from Central U-Boat Command. There was a c contact between the center of the uh, of, of submarines and the boats that were operating outside. And uh, of course they could listen when a boat wouldn't give an answer. So they knew that there was a lot of losses. But nevertheless they uh, did their duty. We, as the captains, were very clearly and frankly informed about the situation. From that time on, we were behind the development, and the hunters got hunted. The U-boats came out with a new device called the snorkel. As the sub was running just beneath the water surface, the snorkel breathed in fresh air through one vent and spewed exhaust out another. That way, the U-boat could recharge its batteries and take on fresh air without exposing itself to enemy radar and attack. With a snorkel, a U-boat could stay underwater where it was safer 24 hours a day. But Dernitz couldn't produce enough snorkels to equip every U-boat, and eventually, Allied radar could spot even the snorkel's tiny profile. It was almost impossible to get two patrols out of a submarine after Black May of 43. The Allies were just too far ahead technologically in their detection and also in their anti-submarine attacks. The guys were still standing in line to volunteer for the U-boat force. 
I'm sure they didn't think they were going out to die. It was always the other guy's submarine that got lost. My submarine is going to come home. I'm sure that was their philosophy. As casualties mounted, U-boats were sent on patrol with inexperienced captains and crews. Many were sunk on their first and only mission. When you suddenly start losing, you cannot call time out and look at the Polaroid pictures of the other team. You can't get the X's and O's going on the chalkboard and then go back into the game. War is a lot more brutal when the whole concept of war is to put the other guy into a negative position and keep shooting and stabbing and bombing until he's dead. That's the unfortunate reality of war. U-boat sailors remain hesitant to criticize Admiral Durnitz. I'm convinced up till now that it was necessary to go out with our boat, even if it was very dangerous. It was war. What should we do else? Should we go to the East Front? It was as well dangerous. It was war. In July of 1944, German shipyards finally delivered the first in a new generation of U-boats, the Type 21 submarine. It could dive deeper and stay down longer than any U-boat before it. It could run faster underwater than on the surface and had a fierce array of new weapons. But the new generation of U-boat had arrived two years behind schedule, and even then, there were mechanical defects. For the U-boat sailors, the Type 21 came too late. By 1945, the ocean floor was littered with U-boats and their victims. The U-boat fleet had sunk 2,882 Allied merchant ships and 175 warships. Of the 842 U-boats that saw combat, 793 had been sunk. Until the final days of the war, U-boat sailors continued to go into battle. Well, I knew that the war was lost anyhow. And of course, I'm very sorry that uh, some people still lost their lives because I sank their ships. Because if you know that the thing is lost anyhow, and you still uh, run around thinking ships, it's a bad feeling. My last patrol, I met an American convoy with six big troop ships. And I saw the GIs on board and were laughing and smoking only two till three hundred meters away. But I could not torpedo a ship. And because I could not torpedo those troop ship, maybe some hundred men had their lives still. Even in the face of defeat, Admiral Karl Dernitz remained loyal to Hitler and the Nazi cause. Upon Hitler's suicide on April 30th, 1945, Dernitz became the second Führer of the Third Reich. On May 7th, 1945, Dernitz surrendered the German forces to the Allies. Dernitz was tried at Nuremberg and sentenced to 10 years in prison. It was the lightest punishment handed out to any of the top Nazi leaders. In part, the light sentence was a result of the Allied Navy's conviction that Dernitz had fought a hard war, but that he had fought it cleanly. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill later confessed that Dernitz U-boats were the only threat that had really frightened him. If the U-boat war had gotten off to the kind of a start that Admiral Dernitz wanted, it probably would have been a very short war. If he'd had 50 more U-boats to put around Great Britain in late 39, early 40, it probably would have forced a, a very quick end to what was then only a regional war. For a long time, England was down to about two weeks worth of fuel. The German U-boats suffered the highest casualty rate in the German military. 
39,000 men volunteered to go to sea in German U-boats. 28,900 of them never returned home. The U-boat force never wavered. The U-boat people at the submarine bases knew what was happening. The boats weren't coming back. Never once did they waver. They kept going out. I'm proud that they did this job. And uh, it's easy nowadays to say, oh, come, they were idiots. No, they knew what risk they were taking, but they were taking it for their country and for their families and for the cause, for the cause they were fighting for. You're proud of this time because you were in it and you survived and you know you were very, very lucky. For those who did survive, their lives would forever be altered. I'm not afraid of, to be dead or to die or to them. I have a good relationship. They're just a friend of mine. No other force saw the casualties witnessed by the men in the German U-boat. It left them linked by a commitment to one another that the years have not and will not erase.